Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, this week we will talk about Transfiguration because that's the feast day this Thursday. So there's 12 great feasts throughout the Orthodox calendar. Um, and of course, it's very important for us to attend services on this day. But maybe we're wondering, you know, what's so special about this particular great feast? Why should I go to church on this day? Well, let's talk a little bit about the feast today to find out what we can gain as Orthodox Christians by being reminded about Christ's transfiguration on Mount Tabor. So 40 days before Christ's crucifixion, he called Peter, James, and John to follow him up the mountain. And so we have three evangelists talk about this, this episode. Um, and we have the three apostles following Christ, while the other apostles remained at the foot of the mountain. And so the three apostles, Peter, James, and John, went up with Christ. And, you know, the reason why he took at least three apostles was, you know, in Deuteronomy, we hear that to have a witness, you need to have at least two witnesses or three witnesses. So Christ takes three witnesses to come. But he chooses specific apostles. He doesn't take all of them because just like with us, with the human race, you know, we are not all, we do not all follow Christ. But we are all called to him, but not everyone heeds to, that, heeds to that call. So we just have a small flock, essentially, following Christ. And so Christ takes these three up the mountain, which by history um, and tradition is Mount Tabor. In the Gospel, it doesn't actually say that it was Mount Tabor. But if you go to Galilee and that part of Israel today, um, there aren't many other mountains in the area. And Mount Tabor is a very special mountain. It's just very... Uh, a gentle slope, and we'll get to a picture in a minute. And so, this is the icon of the feast day. We have Peter, James, and John at the, at the base, trying to hide away from Christ because he transfigured before them. So the light was very bright, they, they could not even look at it. And then on the sides we have uh, the prophet Moses, and then the prophet Elijah, Elias. And so, Christ transfigured at the top of the mountain with the prophets on either side and the three apostles at the bottom. And so when we look, we see how many people in the image? Five. No. Two. Six. Six. We see six people in the image. We see Christ in the center, plus the two prophets, plus the three apostles make six. But there's actually eight as well would be a correct answer because Christ is the Trinity. So the Son of God is in the center. But we also have the voice of God, the Father, which is represented through the shapes, the rhombus there. And then the Holy Spirit is actually the cloud which descended on Christ when the Holy, when God the Father said those words. You said how many people? <laughs> and so, in a, in a way, Transfiguration is a second theophany. Theophany, we know, is the feast day when what happens? The baptized. Christ is baptized, and then God the Father speaks from the heavens, and the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. The Holy Trinity is made manifest for the first time um, on theophany, and then again the Holy Trinity is made manifest. Also, he takes the three <laughs> apostles with him, Peter, James, and John, to represent the faith of Peter, because remember, Peter, Petros, the, the, you are the rock on which I will build that my church. His faith is of, of Christ being the Son of God. Um, hope is James, so St. James is always associated with hope, and love is always St. John the Apostle. John the Theologian is the Apostle of love. So we have faith, hope, and love, which are the three key ingredients to follow Christ and to be saved. He prayed on the mountain, the Apostles fell asleep, then they woke up to Christ transfigured with that bright light. And Moses and Elijah were on either side. We have the two prophets. Prophet Moses is the lawgiver. You know, we have, we have him taking the, the Hebrew nation to the promised land. And God appeared to Moses and gave him the tablets of the law and all the other laws. And so he wrote the law, laws from God. So he's the lawgiver. Because there's a lot of talk about Christ. He's breaking the fulfillments. All the Pharisees and scribes, they said, Christ, he, he, must, he must not be a holy person and of God because he's breaking all these rules which Moses gave, passed down to us, and we've passed down from generation to generation. But by God, 
having Moses up there with him during his transfiguration shows that he is not breaking all the laws of Moses, but in fact fulfilling those laws. And Moses is up there talking to Christ in, in support of him. And we also have Prophet Elijah. He's the foremost of the apostles, and he symbolizes life. Because as Elijah, through, as we know through his life um, in Kings, he was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. So he did not experience an earthly death. So he is alive up in the heavens. He was taken up to the heavens alive. So Prophet Moses, he died. Prophet Elijah was alive. So we have two prophets symboling that God between them is God of the living and God of the dead. And also we have the, the physical realm too, because we have um, Elijah coming from the heavens meeting with Christ, and Moses coming from Hades coming up with Christ, and we have the apostles there of this earthly realm saying that all realms, heavenly, earthly, and beyond, all connect together with God and recognize God as the Christ as the true God. So there's a lot of symbolism in, in, in these the six people or eight personalities which we have there. And, and of course, there was some talk because Christ, a little while before the transfiguration, he asked, you know, who do people say that I am? And some said, oh, you're John the Baptist. Others say, maybe Elijah. And to clear up any confusion that he was Elijah coming back from the dead, Elijah appears with him. So there's, you cannot confuse the two identities. And so God the Father spoke from above. When on Theophany, God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But on transfiguration, he adds, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, or listen to him. And so he adds those words to make sure that the apostles are really paying attention to the teachings that he's given. Because it's just these three apostles, Peter, James, and John, who hear these words. And then, right as, as the cloud descends, the Holy Spirit descends, and God the Father says these words, the prophets already uh, are not there. So that there can be no confusion that Christ is the one that God the Father is talking about. So he wasn't saying that his son is Elijah or his son is Moses. It's Christ, the one who remained. He's his son. Hear him. Listen to him. And so, going on with our theme of a lot of similarities between Theophany and Transfiguration, I've taken um, a little section out of the study journal, um, Family Chokhi, Matushka's little business that she set up, she's actually prepared um, a study journal about the Feast of Transfiguration. And I'm taking a few slides out of this out of this book. And one of them is here about the similarities. So you've got the Venn diagram, Theophany, you know, Jesus is identified as the Son of God, the Messiah. In Theophany, this Holy Spirit appears as a dove. And then we talk about baptism talks about renewing creation and being cleansed. But transfiguration is being transformed and changing into God, becoming more God-like. God is constant. When, when He transfigured, He did not change. His essences are continual. His energies are continual. Everything, all His powers are continual. But man, we can change. We can, through a process of theosis, getting closer to God, becoming God-like, actually change in essence. And that's what the transfiguration shows us. That that divine light, that divine energy, is something that we can experience. Of course, sin separates us from that and gets in the way. But if we work on our spiritual salvation, fight against the passions, through faith, hope, and love, get closer to God, then we can be transfigured and become more God-like. And so the commonality between the two is obviously God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were revealed together as a trinity. In both times, the voice came from the heavens, which was God the Father. But then we see that Christ's divinity is shown through that transfiguration. On Theophany, on the baptism of the Lord, he just stood there as a man. Even though the angels were there, John the Baptist was there, and the dove above him, he did not show any other extra divine you know, manifestation. But on transfiguration, that's where he's really showing that Christ really is fully man and fully God. 
And so he's showing us that. He's showing us those energies, uncreated light. So it's not like a light switch or some other thing that you can create. God was there from the beginning. Nothing, he cannot be created from anything. Everything comes from him. So that light was uncreated. And so when the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ, Peter says, it is good for us here. Let us build three tents for, for you, Christ, and for Moses and, 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 and Elijah. And he says this, but he says, no, you know, you, this, this, this can't work out. You know, why can't this work out? Because Christ, he had to descend from the mountain. Christ had to be crucified and, and die for our sakes. So he couldn't stay there forever, and, and Peter and the other two apostles couldn't just enjoy it. So after that, that's when the cloud descended, and a booming voice from the heavens came. And then that's when they were really afraid, and that's when the two prophets disappeared. And so we, we have that as a reminder that when we feel grace, and I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced it on certain feast days, maybe we've come to church on Pascha and we feel a special grace, but then it, it disappears. Or maybe we go on a pilgrimage, we visit a monastery, we go to the Holy Land, something like that. We feel this special grace, but then it, it leaves and we notice its absence. This is intentional because maintaining that joy constantly is just not sustainable. But God gives us a blessing to experience that joy just a little bit so that we know that experience and so that we can thirst for that experience again and have a repeat of that experience and then make it more regular. And that's, and that's kind of that, that taste that we desire for because man, when God created Adam, was, 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 was created to, to be one with God, but we lost that through the fall. But there are little moments in our lives when we're, we feel that original um, relationship with God which we're meant to have and we're meant to thirst for that. And that's what transfiguration is a reminder to us all. And, and the cloud, uh, we, many times in the Old Testament, appeared, as we know, the cloud um, led both at night as a fiery pillar, then in the daytime as a cloud led the Jewish nation from Egypt into the Promised Land. And so the Holy Spirit appears again as a cloud to remind us that it's the same God. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And so he's reusing those same symbols and that same Manifestation. manifestations of his, of, his, of his divine glory. And so we have, you know, in Exodus, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And so, yeah, we have God, you know, appearing as the burning bush, and the pillar of fire, the three strangers, the three angels to Abraham, many different manifestations. But to keep the consistency, God the Holy Spirit appears again as a cloud, because that's the most common one. We have that cloud, for example, around the Holy of Holies um, in the temple. And so the cloud is often a depiction of God. And so, you know, the Jews, they had this false understanding of who the Messiah would be. And even the apostles, even to the end, like I said, you know, the transfiguration occurred just 40 days before Christ's crucifixion. So for three years already, he had been in teaching and, and, and sermonizing, and the apostles had followed him. But, all, but still, they had these misinformed understandings of, of who Christ was and of what the Messiah would be. And so by Christ standing on the mountain and transfiguring, he showed that he wasn't, going, wasn't like a regular person, wasn't like a, couldn't be a regular king. His idea of being the Savior, of being the Messiah, was something very different. And so transfiguring with that light explained and, and demonstrated to the apostles who they should be expecting. And it gave the apostles strength because they had to endure his crucifixion. They had to watch him suffer and die. But having known that he is God, that he transfigured and showed them that light, that gives them a little bit of comfort um, during these temptations and struggles. So we're moving on to the icon section. Um, and so this, when we look at this icon 
I pretty much explained it at the beginning. We have the two prophets on either side, Moses on the right, holding the book to signify the law, and then prophet Elijah on the left, and the three apostles, Peter, James, and John, representing faith, hope, and love, unable to look. But when you look at Christ in the middle, you see serenity. You see him standing up still and calm, beautiful, with the beautiful radiant robes and the bright light radiating. But the apostles, you are human, who are fearful. You know, Christ often says, fear not, you know, peace be unto you. But humans have this natural tendency to be afraid of something. But we, we also need God in our salvation. So that's why we climb that mountain. So Christ ascending the mountain, he gives us an important lesson that we need to work at getting close to him. So our Christian struggle is not going to be easy. It's difficult. So he climbs that mountain, but it's steady. That Mount Table is a very even mountain. So we just need to keep going at a slow and steady getting to God. Then we will feel that grace and become one with God. And St. Seraphim of Surov, there is a, a famous episode of him, you know, sharing that uncreated light. Matavilov, he, he asked, you know, you know, how do we get to know God and, and how do you experience God and feel it and know you're one with God? And St. Seraphim, you know, says, well, I'll show you. And basically in the forest, in the middle of winter there, he, he has this light and he just completely lights up. And, but the villa, the first, couldn't look at him because he was so bright, and he stayed away. But then, you know, Saint Seraphim brought, brings him in into that that light, and then he feels it and experiences it, and he feels exactly what Saint Peter felt. He felt it was good, and he did not want to leave. He felt joy and happiness and sweetness, a true divine happiness, not a temporal earthly happiness. And that's what Transfiguration reminds us that even though our life is temporary. We are immortal, and God is immortal, and we can join Him for eternity. That's why the number eight is such an important number. And we, we can join Him. And, and the happiness and the, and the joys of this earth fade away. doesn't matter if you have a nice meal. A couple of hours later, you forget about it. If you have a good experience with something, at the moment it feels good, but then it dissipates. But with God, when you have that joy, it is eternal. And so that's, that's what we should be striving for. St. John of Shanghai and San Francisco, there's a couple of, you know, occurrences where one time he was serving a Malibin, one time he was reading the Gospel, he would just radiate with that uncreated light. And everyone in the church saw it. It wasn't just something that was an accident caught on camera. No, everyone who was praying with St. John in the church saw that light come down. Mount Table, as I said, has a very gentle slope, and it, and it sticks out in, in you know in the Holy Land in Galilee. There aren't any; it's not part of a mountain range. It's just a lone mountain there, so there's not much confusion about which mountain Christ could have transfigured on. And we even know from Saint David that you know on Table and Hermon, my name will be um, Table, and Her Hermon will rejoice in in Christ's name, and so. And so we know that, that Tabor is, is remembered in, in, the, in the Bible, in the Psalms, and, and, and the church teaches that this is that moment that St. David was, was foreseeing. This was when Tabor would rejoice, when Christ was transfiguration, transfiguring on top of that mountain. And so we have this gradual mountain that shows that, yes, we have to ascend to God, and there'll be battles, and there'll be difficulties, and we'll fall down. But ultimately, God is trying to lead us to Him gradually and in a fair way to get to Him. It's not, he didn't transfigure on Mount Everest. That would have been a difficult mountain for us to climb. He transfigured it on, on Mount Table. So it makes it feel you know, possible for us to be able to join Him. And every year on Mount, on, on Mount Table, on the Feast of Transfiguration, so the 6th of August on the Old Calendar, which is the 19th, at the monastery on the top of the mountain, there's two. There's the Orthodox one and then there's a the Catholic one. But on the Orthodox side, people come and they go to the midnight service. Once the liturgy is over, like 3 a.m., they come out 
and then this cloud descends. This cloud descends on this mountain, and they feel this cloud, and sometimes it's an uh, orangish kind of color, and they can just feel this cloud in the middle of the night. So it's the middle of summer in Israel, there are no clouds, no rain at that time of year, but this special cloud appears and descends on the mountain. And this is a miracle that happens every year. And so Saint Nikolai Vidimirovich, the great Serbian 20th century saint, says, why did transfiguration occur on a mountain and not in a valley? So as to teach us two virtues, love of labor and godly thoughts. For climbing to the heights require labor, and the heights themselves represent the elevation of our thoughts to the things of God. So we're looking up. And, and mountains with the Jews had a very important symbolism. They, the Sermon on the Mount and many other adventures, the Jews saw the mountains as a special creation of God, as a, as a symbol of God's glory, that he created these wonders. And so any time something happened on a mountain, there was always this association with a being connected to the divine. On Transfiguration, we bless fruit. That's a tradition. Um, and, you know, some, some churches bless just apples, some bless just grapes, some bless all sorts of fruit. Um, there's different traditions with different areas, obviously, what's in season for that particular country. For example, in Australia, it, we don't bless that much fruit on Transfiguration. We're in the Southern Hemisphere. We actually do the fruit blessing on, on the meeting of the Lord, which is in February which is connected to the harvest season. So we actually bless fruit two times a year on Transfiguration to maintain the connection with the Northern Hemisphere and the tradition of the church, but also um, on, on the Feast of the Entry um, because that's the season where everything's right. But here in the Northern Hemisphere, even though there may not be all the, all the fruits of the earth um, in the desert, we take what's, what's, what's in season and we bring it to church for the blessing. And the reason why we bless fruit is because the fruit symbolizes, well, sweetness and something that's good. But we need the sun so that fruit becomes ripe. And that's just like our spiritual life. Without God's grace, without you know, that transfiguration, that transformation from God's divine energies, that fruit will never ripen and we, we will never develop into what we were meant to be. So we need to, like, like, the, like the garden, trim, trim the weeds, pull the weeds out, you know, pull out our passions. We need to have order in our life. We need to follow the, follow the church calendar and have that order. But then we need the sunshine, which is God's grace, so that we, we come. So the fruit is a symbol of what we need to emulate in our, in our spiritual lives. We don't want to be, you know, sour grapes or sour apples. We want to be sweet. And so... So we, we, tr we try to focus on, on our spiritual lives, fighting the passions, living the gospel commandments in faith, hope, and love. And then through God's grace, we'll become sweet and desirable. This is God intended. And so we have our little journey. Number one was when man was first created, but then man fell through the temptation of eating of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And so he fell, but then by the tree, but then we, we, he, he comes back and this little little drawing shows that theosis is that, is that process of getting close to God and we get there finally at his resurrection. So God creates man, we were, made, we were designed for theosis, but sin got in the way, fell into the sin so we couldn't have union with God. But God makes a promise, God makes a promise and he gives the law to Moses about who to expect, who the Savior will be. And finally, the Messiah is born, and that little, that little image there is, is the star of Bethlehem. So Christ is born, you know, in Bethlehem. Um, and, and all the prophecies are being fulfilled. Finally, we see that, that Jesus really is God and man through his transfiguration, that light which is there. And we are focusing towards that, and then we keep on going on our journey towards God through his holy resurrection, because he saves, saves all of us through his resurrection. So that's my little presentation for this evening. I kept it short. Um, I can receive any questions. Thank you. There, will be, there are some alive today that will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in glory. Is yes. that the transfiguration? 
Yeah, transfiguration. That's why it took Peter, James, and John. He, they were there when he said those words just before, about a week before. He showed them his glory in the transfiguration. So he's fulfilling those words. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but as you said, there was a great cloud descending um, on Mount Tabor. Was there, um, did the Orthodox only see it? What about the Catholics? Oh, when anyone <laughs> goes, goes to Mount Tabor on, on the Feast of, of Transfiguration, yes, they see the, the cloud. If you're at that place, you'll see the cloud. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're Orthodox or not, if you're at that part of the mountain, Jesus. you will see that Catholic. cloud. Is it in August 6th or August 10th? Does it, come down on, does it come down on new calendar? No, it only comes <laughs> down on the Julian calendar. So August 6th, which is 13 days later, the 19th. Okay. Yes, it always comes down on the old calendar, Feast of Transfiguration. She read the Catholic monastery on the other side of the mountain. Yeah, no, the, mount, the cloud, well, my understanding is the cloud is on the Orthodox side. But I've seen a picture where they have a cloud, and it looks like it's on the whole mountain, so I'm not sure how you divide a cloud. <laughs> I've never been there, I've never seen it, so but that's my understanding. Definitely the Orthodox side if you want to see it. <laughs> Can you talk more about how the services, like Old Testament readings and the evening service, kind of touch on the Old Testament, like how there's a relationship and what we hear? Yeah, I mean, in the evening service for Transfiguration, um, a, a lot of times you'll hear, like I mentioned, like about Tabor and Hermon will, will rejoice. There are other psalms with similar references to, to this event. Um, and then we, we hear in the Old Testament meetings specifically about um, the Hebrew people being led, led to the promised land. Um, we talk, hear about the fiery pillar and we hear about the cloud and we hear about you know the unburning bush. We hear about a lot of other um, representations of God's manifestation to man throughout the Old Testament. They are repeated in the service to connect all of those manifestations to Christ himself and to this event on Transfiguration where God again reveals himself as one in three persons. So that's why it's good to go to the evening service as much as and liturgy too? Yes, and so <laughs> yes, there's a lot to learn from the services. So you know, it's wonderful that people have, are, are watching me on YouTube tonight or are here to listen, but it's really important to practice our faith to attend the services. Um, and like I said at the beginning, there are 12 great feasts of the year. It's important for us to attend services. There's a special meaning in all of them. This, this one, we have, the, we have the explanation of that feeling of grace being taken away from us. Often I hear people, it's like, why do I feel like I'm forsaken? Why am I not feeling blessed? Well, that's God is testing your faith. God sometimes gives you a little bit of extra grace to give you that strength to get through difficult times. But conversely, He will take it away from you feeling that closeness of God so that you thirst for it more. So, that, so we constantly experience that in our spiritual lives. Transfiguration reminds us that's normal. That's what's meant to happen. That we're meant to thirst more for that grace and then be transfigured by it. We're not, but we're not meant to just, you know, stay in one place and, and build a little tent, you know, for, for Christ and the prophets and just say, all is done. No, we need to struggle. And so we need to continually struggle. And that's what Transfiguration teaches us. That one, God truly is God and Jesus truly is God and man. But that um, divine energy we can participate in. You know, there are lots of, you know, conversations you know, between St. Gregory Palamas, you know, and, and Western theologians, Balaam specifically at that time, saying that, you know, man cannot experience God's grace to such a degree. But, but St. Gregory Palamas, because of his experience on Mount Athos, he was a true man of prayer. He knew that you could be transfigured, that a, a regular human being could be transfigured by Christ. And so he, that's why he argued in the triads, his writings, that this is possible and this is part of our Orthodox teaching. And that's why on the second Sunday of Great Lent, which is close to when the Transfiguration happened, 40 days before his, his crucifixion, we remember St. Gregory Palamas on that second Sunday. Now we've moved Transfiguration 
out of Great Lent because it's a great feast. And if we had that at the beginning of Great Lent, it would kind of, you know, not, not set the tone well for Great Lent. So the fathers decided, let's move it 40 days before Christ's, you know, elevation of the cross. So his crucifixion, you know, his cross was lost. But after several centuries, St. Helena found his cross. And 40 days before that event, they decided, let's remember his transfiguration. So that's why we celebrate Transfiguration on the 6th of August. So yeah, I'll see you all at church tomorrow night <laughs> and on the feast of Thursday. Thank you.